How many came here today in need of what Jesus has to give to you? You know that there's only so many places we can go before we get tired of looking for whatever it is that's gonna meet our needs until we finally find ourselves at a place where we can have everything that we need and it's found in the name of Jesus. There's no other name, there's no other person and I'm here to let you know that what you're looking for is really a person. Who you're looking for is Jesus. You'll find hope, you'll find peace, you'll find freedom, you'll find a new start. And today you maybe have come in with some bondage or baggage. I have good news for you today. Today you can be free. Today you can receive hope and receive a new start. Today you can receive what Jesus has been trying to get to you, his life, his joy, his peace. How many want the fresh outpouring of what God has for you this morning? Let's pray. Father, we thank you right now for all that you have. Lord, we, we come to bring you honor and glory and praise because you're worthy of it. And we know that in return, God, you meet every one of our needs. My Father, Father I ask, Lord, that as we hear a word today, as we hear a message from you, God, we ask, Lord, that it would leave us feeling encouraged. It would give us a sense of direction. It would help us point us closer to you, God. Holy Spirit, speak today. Without you, I have nothing to say. But God, with you, Lord, there's a word for us today. Bring your word. Convict our hearts as we open up to you, God. Have your way. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we all say amen and amen. You may be seated, church. Give someone a high five on your way down and let them know, I'm excited to see you today. Well, good morning and welcome to The Way. We got a packed house today. Give yourself a round of applause for making it out. I want to give honor to my pastor, Pastor Marco Garcia, to our pastor. Don't we have the best pastor in the world? We want to give honor to Pastor Marco. Thank you so much. He's been teaching at a conference and uh, spending time with his family. Well, we're really grateful and we want to honor him. We also want to take a moment to honor our veterans. If you fought at any of our armed forces or fought for our country, can you stand to your feet right now if you have if you have fought in any capacity? Can we give them a round of applause for those that have fought for our country? Come on, let's really hear it for them. Because of you guys, we get to freely worship God in this country. We get to preach the gospel. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We got a father and son here who fought for our country. Thank you, guys. Awesome. You know, we also want to say thank you to all those who fought at home on the home front. I know this is a difficult season. If you've lost a loved one, they've fought for this country. We want to honor you this morning as well. And thank you for fighting from home. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause today, this Memorial Day. You know, we're going into our anniversary month. Our church is going to be 18 years old. We are officially an adult church. That means God's going to get, going to get uh, release some great things in the kingdom in Jesus' name. But we're kicking off anniversary month this, uh, this very soon. And what we're going to do, we're going to do something called Way Back Wednesday, where we're going to highlight all the great things that God has already done and accomplished, accomplished in 18 years. Get this, in 18 years, we've been able to touch the city and reach the city of San Bernardino, two campuses in this city. We also have gone over to Pomona. We have a campus in Pomona. We have a campus that is launching in Compton. We have a campus that's launching in Arizona. We have a campus that is already launched in Kenya. We have a campus that's launched in TJ. We have a family campus that's launched in Oregon. We have campuses all over the world, church. 18 years. Just imagine what God can do in 18 more years. So this Wednesday, we're going to have a service. We're going to have an outdoor service. We're going to see the fire of God. We're going to pray over our city. And we're going to be out there praying and believing for God to do incredible things in our city. There'll also be cool things like food trucks and games. And, and we're going to have a great time. This Wednesday, invite a friend. Not only that, but Holy Warriors is launching this Tuesday and Sunday. Where are all the Holy Warriors graduates at? Congratulations. We're going to talk a little more about what it means to be a disciple today. And today we're actually going to talk a little bit about what even Holy Warriors is. But I, wanted, I want us to go into scripture and find out what scripture teaches us 
about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Today we're going to learn what, what are the five marks of a true disciple of Jesus. The word disciple is not, believe it or not, is not as common among Christians. But Jesus didn't say, go make Christians. He said, go make disciples. But I read a stat that only one in four Christians even, even think that word discipleship is, rel- is relative to their life. It's relatable. It's a, it's, that means the majority of Christians don't even think that discipleship is even something worth doing. But we're going to talk about what is so important about this word discipleship. Now, Jesus didn't say, here's a good suggestion. Be a disciple. It might help. No, it was a command that Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. And if Jesus felt so strongly about being a disciple, then I think it's worth us exploring the scripture and seeing what God has to say about it. The problem isn't that there aren't enough believers in this world. There are a lot of believers in this world. I think the majority of people you probably talk to say they believe in God. Did you know even demons believe in God and tremble? So believing in God isn't the issue. The problem is there aren't enough disciples in this world. Someone that follows Jesus. Someone that lives for him. Today we're going to learn about what it means to live and follow Jesus as a disciple. Someone say disciple. Matthew 15, 8 says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Yeah, this is an encouraging scripture to start with on a Sunday morning. But we're going to find out what Jesus says. And believe me, there's good news that Jesus is calling even those that the world sees an outcast. He's calling them to become a disciple. Jesus didn't pick the people that were high and mighty in church to follow him. He found the tax collectors. He found the sinners. He found the working man. He found those that were lost. And he said, come follow me. And if you feel like you came in this room lost or bound or broken, Jesus has a message for you. He's saying, come follow me. I'll give you rest. I'll give you a sense of purpose. Come follow follow me. I got something for you. And you're in the right place today. But let's talk about it. What are the five marks of a true disciple? Mark number one, love and follow Jesus. Love and follow Jesus. Wow, that's so profound. I would never would have thought a disciple needed to love Jesus. Believe it or not, a disciple should love Jesus. Loving God means this though. It means putting him above anyone else on our priority list. I know we have favorites. There's people in our life we love probably more than others. If you're a parent, you probably, don't tell your kids this, but you probably love one more than the other. I don't know, maybe. Don't tell them though. It's messed up. But Luke 14, 26 says this. You cannot be my disciple unless you love me more Then you love your father and mother, your wife and children and your brothers and sisters. You cannot follow me unless you love me more than you love your own life. See, who you love most determines who you live for. The person I'm living for is the one that I love the most. When we love God the most, we live for him. When I love people around me most, I live for the people around me. And you know what's scarier than than all of that or what's something that I think we all get trapped in? It's not that we live for others the most. You know the number one person that's that's in competition in your own heart as number one is yourself. We put our own selves as number one in our hearts. And God sometimes isn't competing with your attention around other people. He's competing for the attention of the person you're looking at in the mirror. And we live life, and sometimes I think we live this Christian walk, and we live live this type of Christianity. We live the what's in it for me Christianity. When Jesus didn't have a what's in it for me mentality, when he gave his life up on the cross, he gave everything. He laid it all down for us. 
And in order to love God, we got to have that same kind of love. Where we lay everything down at his feet and give everything up. That we don't love anyone else. And there's no close second place to the love that you have for God. I said this before. That my wife knows that she's number two in my life. She's not number one. But she doesn't want to be number one in my life. Why? Because I'm a better husband to her when she's number two in my life. And God's number one. For those that have kids, your kids are going to have a better parent, a better mother, and a better father when they don't have them as number one. But instead, God is number one in your life. Your spouse, your husband, your wife, your family, your better son, your better father, your better brother, your better sister, when you have God as number one in your life. Keep God in first place and everything else will follow. To follow Jesus means to let him lead you. Let him guide you. If I'm following Jesus, that means he's in the front, not me. He's in the driver's seat, not me. I think the opposite is often true. That we want to lead Jesus around. We want to tag Jesus on to our lifestyle. We want to live a certain way and make decisions and be whoever we want to be without, without asking or without letting Jesus follow us. We say, Jesus, tag along my life. I want you to tap into what I'm doing. Well, let's go to the next point. Mark number one, love and follow Jesus. And you know, Jesus is so good. He wants you to follow him. And I think sometimes we think that Jesus doesn't want anything to do with you when that's so far from the truth. Jesus paved the way for you. Jesus has promises for you. Jesus has blessings for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a life for you that only he can give you and he wants to give it to you. Follow him. Believe him. Let him lead you. And let's go to Mark number two of a true disciple. Love one another. Love one another. Now, we can't say we follow a loving God if we're not loving one another. I follow a loving God, but I ain't loving. Are you sure you're following him? John 13, 34 says, a new commandment I give to you. A new what? A new what? Commandment I give you. Not a suggestion. Not a good tip. It says, a good commandment I give you, that you love one another. This isn't just life skills. This isn't life 101. This isn't good tips, uh, life hack on how to have a good life. No, this is a commandment from the king of kings. This is what you must do. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That word love is that, this word agape, which means to welcome, to be fond of. It means to think good thoughts for, towards somebody, to be blessed, to bless somebody. We practice this, not just in our thought, but in our action. It's something we must do. But how do we love somebody? It's easy to love the lovable. It's easy to love the nice people. It's easy to love the people that always smile at you when you walk in the room. It's easy to love the people that you're happy to see all the time and they're so happy to see you. I love you. You know, it's like, how many have dogs? You have a dog. Like, you just can't not love your dog. You, you, go, you get home and it's like the dog's like, I never thought I would see you again. I'm so glad you're home. <laughs> Please don't ever leave me, ever. That's the way dogs greet us. That's why we love dogs so much. We're just like, I love you. I'll do anything for you, anything. And then your husband comes in and you're like, eh. But we got to love the way Jesus, how do we love people that aren't so lovable? Well, Jesus taught us, he said, I want you to love them the way I have loved you. You know, come on, you know, and I know, and I know that you know. That at some point in your life, you weren't very lovable towards the Lord. I mean, he loves you unconditionally. But believe me, if you look at my history, if you looked at my lifestyle, believe me, there's dark times in my life where I don't look very lovable. 
As a matter of fact, my life is so offensive to the Lord, and yet even then, he loved me. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, that God showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know the way that Jesus modeled love? Is he says that I sacrificed everything while you were the most offensive towards me. And this is how he wants us to love others. Love someone even to the point, all the way to the point, that when they're offensive to you, that you bless them back. That's why the Bible says, bless those that curse you. Because he modeled it when he loved us. We cursed him with our lifestyle. We offended him with the way we were living. And yet he died for us and he gave everything. And now we're grateful. And the way we love others is in that same way. That while someone has been offensive towards you, while someone has done something to hurt you, while someone maybe abandoned you, left you, talked about you behind your back, can you love them, sacrifice for them, even while they're offensive towards you? I thank God that Jesus didn't wait for me to make up for my sin before he died for me because it would have never happened. He showed me mercy when I didn't deserve it. He showed me grace when I did not earn it. And that's how he wants us to love others. This is a mark of a true disciple. Someone that can love somebody when they're offensive to you. That's hard to do. That's something I can't do on my own. I need the power of the Holy Spirit for that. Trust me. I can't do that on my own. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can love those that curse you. And you know what's going to help somebody to get set free? When they begin to see the love of God within you. And maybe God, oh man, this is crazy. Maybe God has been giving you opportunity after opportunity to minister to the, your family members through loving them while they're being offensive. You're like, man, this person can't get it right. I'm just trying, I'm trying to tell them to change and they don't want to change. Maybe God is, doesn't want you to just preach at them and tell them to change. Maybe he wants you to love them. Maybe God's like, yeah, let me bring them, let me bring them with the edginess, let me bring them towards you with their offense, with their offense, and with their, with their hurt, and with their pain, and let me bring them with all their baggage, and just love them, and watch what I'll do in their life. So let's look for those opportunities to love people, even when they're not very lovable. That's a true mark of a disciple right there. Mark number three of a true disciple Abide in the word. Abide in the word. This is more than just believing in God. But it's living for him. John 8, 31 says, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Other, other translations say, if you obey my commandments, you are truly my disciples. That word abide means to live out or to act in accordance with something. So what does that mean, abide in the word? Does it mean I just read my Bible every day and I'm a true disciple? Well, no, because the devil knew the Bible too. But he was definitely not a disciple. I'm not saying don't read your Bible. Definitely read your Bible. Please read your Bible. But the, the way I really abide in the word is I act in accordance to what I'm reading. So it's one thing to say, oh, I read the Bible every day, brother. I read three chapters, four chapters, every hour. I'm a saint. I've read the Bible 45 times last month. Okay. <laughs> it's one thing to say I've read the Bible a lot, but it's another thing to act in accordance with what you're reading. To abide in the word means my lifestyle, my thoughts, my habits, the way I conduct myself, the way I represent myself outside of the church walls is in accordance with the word of God. A mark of a true disciple is abiding in the word. You know, Mike preached a great message on Wednesday. He said that one moment, one encounter with God can change your life, but only obedience to God can define your life. 
Only obedience to God can sustain your life. Only obedience to the word can keep you going and keep you growing as a true disciple. True disciples do what God says. You know, one good way to learn how to live that kind of lifestyle, learning how to obey, is following after all these amazing graduates that were up here on stage. Sign up for Holy Warriors. I mean, you've heard it over and over again. Sign up, sign up, sign up. And sometimes we think that's for the other person. That's for the, that's for the other crowd. That's for somebody else. I come to church. That's good enough for me. What if today God is saying, now I want you to sign up today. It's your turn. It's your turn to take that step. And I want to show you how to live like a true disciple. I want to show you how to follow my word. I believe God is saying, I want to show you how to live in my blessing, in my abundance, in my power, in my authority over the enemy. I want to show you how to operate in your spiritual gifts. I want to show you how to grow and be a warrior that can fight. I want to show you. Number four, act. I mean, the four mark of a true disciple, bear much fruit, bear much fruit. I'm not much of a fruit eater. I don't like fruits or veggies. I know, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't really, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what is wrong with me. <laughs> That's the way the Lord made me. My wife still tries to sneak veggies in, in, the, in the dinner. She does though, it's really good. She cooks good, my wife cooks good. She cooks good. As you can tell, I got kind of, you know, I got married and then people are like, dang, Christian, do you get in a, you, re, you really let go, huh? Why you laugh so hard? Bear much fruit. Bear much fruit. You know what that means? True disciples leave a mark. True disciples make an impact. John 15, 8 says, by this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. You want to know how you can prove that someone is a true disciple? They're bearing fruit. Another way to say that is bearing fruit. What does that mean? Bearing fruit? I got a farm in my backyard? No. It means you're producing results that show evidence that God is living in and through you. That the Holy Spirit is active in you. That you're growing in your walk. There's evidence for it. What are those evidence? What does that result look like? Well, it could look like using self-control in an area where you normally wouldn't use self-control in. Results sometimes look like being patient with somebody that you normally are really short-tempered with. Results could even be being faithful, being consistent coming to church every week and being faithful with the assignment God is giving you. For all the leaders in here, being faithful could mean being faithful with, the, with the, those that God has entrusted underneath your care. Who is the person that God has assigned to you? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But what are the results? What is bearing fruit? It could be all those things. Using self-control. When you want to go back to the bottle, when you want to go back to the weed, when you want to go back to the club scene, when you want to go back to the old friends, when you want to go back to the old way of thinking, when you want to go back to your old way of handling business, making money, God is saying is you don't go back. Use self-control. That's the result of a true disciple. When you use self-control and you can look the devil in the eyes and say, nope, I'm done with you. I'm done with my old way of living. I'm done with my old lifestyle. I'm submitted to God. And devil, I'm resisting you out of my life. Now flee. Go on, get. We got to learn to kick the devil out the house. We, got, we gave him a spare. We kick him out, but we give him a spare key. You can come back later. Kick him out. Lock him out. Don't let him back in. Turn from it. That's the mark of a true disciple. It's I can now use self-control in an area where I used to lose all control. This is produced from the Holy Spirit and it will give these to you and they're accessible to you now. But it takes somebody to just walk it out, to live that out. You know what else is interesting about fruit? Is that the good fruit takes time. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, 
but I chose and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. In other words, I've appointed you that your fruit should last. I've appointed you to bear fruit and that your fruit actually lasts. No more of these little cycles and these growth spurts. We, I mean, or these, these short spurts of, of, of running and stopping, running and stopping, running and pulling back. No, no more of this. And I believe we're going we're gonna to cancel that spirit of backsliding where we're on fire for a month and we're turning back for a few months. And we're on fire for one month and then we're turning back to the world. We're done with that. You know what? I think today's the day where we're going to bear fruit that lasts and we're going to bear fruit that goes all the way to the next generation and the next generation and all the way into my future. And I'm going to see all that God can do in my life because I'm not turning back anymore. We need fruit that lasts. You know, there are two words in the scripture are really important. Bear fruit. The word bear means to endure the difficulty of something with patience. The word fruit means to bring, it's the results of your labor. In other words, let me put it simply. What Jesus is literally saying is I created you, and I want you to get this. I created you to endure the toughness that it takes to produce lasting fruit. In other words, he's saying, I have specifically assigned you to produce the kind of fruit that requires a fight within you. I did not call you to produce the kind of fruit that requires no fight within you. I have called you to produce the fruit that requires some kind of fight within you. God doesn't want no microwavable fruit. That don't even sound good. You're trying to microwave a banana? Don't try it. We don't do that. The only seed you microwave is popcorn. I think. I don't know. Don't try to microwave no seed and try to bear a fruit tree out of it. What God is saying, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. And the kind of fruit I want to see you produce is going to require a fight within you. That means sometimes you're going to have to fight to come back to church. Sometimes you're going to have to fight to just love your spouse. Sometimes you're going to have to fight to keep going back to your discipleship group. You're going to have to fight to keep it going. And when you feel like nothing is working out, keep fighting. Keep staying in the fight. Keep going. Keep pushing. And what God is saying, that is the kind of fruit that will last. It's the kind of fruit that requires a fight within you. And it was a fight for a lot of us to be here this morning. It was a fight for you to come back to church today. It was a fight. There's something fighting within you. Maybe all week long, you've been going through some crazy warfare. Maybe this has been happening for the past month and you've been fighting just to stay in there. I want to say I'm proud of you because you fought and you're here today and you made it. And you know what? That's the kind of action. That's the kind of lifestyle that's going to produce fruit in your life. That's going to last a really long time. I want you guys to give your neighbor a round of applause for being here in church today. They made it out. And the fifth mark, the last mark of a true disciple is to learn from disciples and make more disciples. A disciple, a real student, a real follower of Jesus will pay it forward. In other words, they'll share what they've been given. Disciples are not stingy. Disciples are generous. What do I mean by that? I'm not, just talking, I'm not talking about your finances. Although disciples are generous, we are generous in our finances. We give to meet needs. I love that video that we saw earlier of the, uh, the distribution center. Let's give a hand to our distribution team and the team that does that. And the, the food comes in and goes right out. It comes in and goes right out. And all of our campuses, it's, it's flooding all over to feed and to meet needs. Disciples are generous. They give towards that. But not only generous in that, but generous in what you've learned. Generous in what you got from church today. See, a real disciple will take this and will give it to somebody. Give it to your kids. We'll give it to your brother, your sister. Give it to your cousin. Give it to somebody at home. Give it to your parents. But whatever you got, a disciple says, I want to share this with somebody. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is a good example of that. Paul's talking to his disciple. He says, look, you've heard me teach. 
Now I want you to tell these same things to followers who can be entrusted to tell others. He's saying, I want you to share with what I've been giving you. Give it out because there's plenty of it. So I got a question for you. Who is teaching you? Who is discipling you? Because we can't say that we're being discipled if nobody is teaching us. No, I thank God that the reason I'm here today, even preaching, is because people have poured into me. And I thank God for my mentor, my leader, Pastor Marco, who pours into me and he receives from God and he dumps it all on me. And I'm just like, thank you. He receives from God and he gives. And in the same way I receive from God and I give to those that I get to teach. The question is, who is teaching you? Because it can't be someone from the pulpit, just from the pulpit. It also needs to be someone that's close to your life. Someone that can get all up in the business. Someone that you can be honest with. Someone that you can call late at night. Someone that can pray with you. Who is that person that's discipling and mentoring you? Now, if you don't have somebody, you came to the right place today. I believe we can, we can find and we can help partner you up with someone that is excited. They've been praying for you, even though they don't even know you yet. They've been praying, God, I want to disciple someone who's hungry, who's ready to grow, who's ready to learn and wants to go to the next level. Today's the day. I got another question for you. If you do have someone that's teaching you, I got a question for you. Who are you teaching? There are people that God will place in your life that he wants you to share with. There are people that God wants you to take care of. The big question is, can you be trusted with who God is entrusting to you? You know how it's a good indication that God is sending someone your way to be discipled, to be cared for? They're probably not a perfect person. They're probably hurting. They're probably lost. They're probably broken. They're probably sick inside. They probably got a lot of problems. That's a good indication that God has put this person in your path so you can share with them what has helped you through your difficulty, through, you, through, through your hard days, through your brokenness, through your pain. How has God helped you? And when God sends someone your way that has been in your path, it's an opportunity for you to help that person. Who is teaching you and who are you teaching? Today's an opportunity to answer that call and to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. These, these are the marks of a disciple. And then there's so many more, but these are the ones we covered today. To love and follow Jesus. To also love one another. To abide in the word, which means to obey the word to bear much fruit and to fight to see these results in our lives and to learn from disciples and make more disciples. How many want to live a life as a true disciple? As a true disciple. Praise God. It, let's all stand this morning. There's an amazing stat before anyone leaves. You know that if we filled this room with a thousand people every single day, a thousand people, and we evangelize and preach the gospel to them, a thousand people and they receive Jesus, and next day a new thousand people and we receive Jesus, and then the next day a new thousand people and we receive Jesus, you know we could reach the whole world, but it would, it would take 19,000 years to do it. Stats show, if we fill this room with a thousand people every single day and preach the gospel, we can reach the world in 19,000 years. But if I train, if I disciple just three people, and it took me one whole year to disciple just three people, and then next year, they did the same thing, and they each discipled three people people we could reach the entire world in 27 years the whole world this shows us how important discipleship discipleship is to the lord if we try to evangelize to a thousand people a day it would take 19,000 years but if we just 
would be discipled and disciple three people in a year, we could reach the entire world in 27 years. Today, I want to give an opportunity for anybody who is saying, I want to be a true disciple of Jesus. Maybe in any one of these five marks, you felt like you were falling short. Or maybe one of those are missing in your life. And you're saying, I want to become a true disciple. I, I, don't, want, I don't want to be just a, a come in and come out. I want to become a true disciple of Jesus. And maybe one of these five things I'm lacking and I need to grow in or I'm struggling or it's missing in my life. I want to follow Jesus fully and completely. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Just raise your hand. You're just proud. No shame. You're saying, I want to follow Jesus. I, I see your hand. I see your hand. I see all those hands right here. I see those hands back there. I see those hands back there. I see your hands. Good job. I see your hands. I see your hands. Awesome. Awesome. Now, this is a really important decision you're making when you raise your hand. Because what you're doing is you're telling everyone in this room that I'm stepping up and I'm, allow, I'm gonna allow the Holy Spirit to lead me in this. And you allow the Holy Spirit, you allow Jesus to lead you to respond to that call. That's step number one, and we're really proud of you. And if you raise your hand, I want you to do something for me. I want you to take a bold step, and I want you to make your way out of your seat. And I want you to come up here so we can pray for you, and we can agree with you, and we can stand in the gap with you. Can we give a round of applause for those that raise their hand? Don't be ashamed. Don't fear. Even if you're way back there, come on up. We want to pray with you. Church, let's really clap it up for these new disciples. Congratulations. Congratulations. Look at these guys. Look at awesome. Come on, let's clap it up. They're still coming. They're still coming, church. They're still coming, church. Come on, these are true disciples making a stand today to follow Jesus. I mean, we got some more altar workers over here. We, we, have a, we have a big group coming on this side. If we got some more altar workers, we could use your help right now. I want to make one more call. And this is a call. The Bible says that the wages of our sin is death. But that's the thing. I'm a pretty good person. I, I, don't, I don't murder. I don't steal. I don't really tell bad lies, maybe white lies. But I'm, I'm a good person. The thing is, I've sinned. I've sinned, I'm not perfect. And there's one thing I know for sure, everyone in this room has sinned. The Bible says all have fallen short. And you know what the consequence for sin is? It's death. That's another way to say eternal separation from God. So you mean to tell me because I've sinned, I'm going to hell? The bad news, unfortunately, is yes. Because we've sinned, we're going to hell. But God saw this and intervened. And what God did is he loved you so much that while you were in, the, the, in the, the middle of your darkest, lowest, most sinful state, he sent Christ to die for you. Which means you could have done nothing at all to earn that from him. He did it simply because he loves you. Because he loves you. Today, can receive a new start you can receive a new life you can receive forgiveness of your sins you can receive salvation so that if you die you don't have to spend eternity separated from God you can spend eternity in heaven with God forever and you can you can begin life even here on earth you can start walking with the new start as a new creation free from sin and bondage and all it takes is putting your faith in Jesus repenting turning away from your old life and turning to God. Today could be that day for you. If you're saying today, that I don't know where I'd go if I died, but I wanna to go to heaven. If you're saying you wanna receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you wanna make him Lord of your life, you wanna receive forgiveness of your sins and receive salvation, then when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand if you're not up here already. One, two, three. 
three, raise your hands, raise your hand. Good job, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you. Anybody else, I'm proud of you, I see you right there. Anybody else, you're saying that's me. That's me, I wanna receive Jesus, I see you. If you raise your hand right now, I want you to come on up, we wanna pray with you. Come on up, if you raise your hand, come on up. Come on up, and church, let's clap it up for those that are receiving Jesus this morning. more altar workers please if you're a leader if you're a leader in here we need your help if you're a discipleship group leader we need your help um, we need some women over here in this section some altar workers if you if you're here today and you can help please we we really need your help we want to pray with you today for everyone that came up here there's an altar worker there's a prayer partner really they're going to help you they're going to assist you take your next step and your next step is a class called holy warriors learning how to become a true disciple of Jesus. You're going to get baptized. You're going to get resources. You're going to learn how to study the Bible and grow. And you're going to, it's going to help you in your walk with God. Well, let's bow our heads, everybody. Let's close our eyes and let's pray. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me enough that you would die for me. Forgive me of my sin. I've messed up. I've fallen short, but I need you. Forgive me. I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross and rose from the dead so I can be saved. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Make me a new creation. Save me. I receive the free gift of eternal life. From this moment forward, I'll never be the same. I am a disciple. I will follow you. I will live for you. I will love others. I will abide in your word. I will bear fruit. And I will make disciples. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all say amen and amen. Church, can we give God some praise for what he's done up here? But this is the fruit. This is the fruit. We love you, church. Don't forget that Holy Warriors launches this Tuesday night and next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. If you want to sign up for that, go to the app and sign up. This Wednesday, we kick off way back Wednesday. We're going to celebrate, kick off 18 years of, of ministry. And we're going we're gonna to pray. We're going to have Fire Fridays, outdoor services on Wednesdays. We love you, church. God bless you. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you. Have a wonderful Sunday, wonderful Memorial Day weekend. God bless you.